Their words were honey-dipped and bound by the thick twine of kinship, extending so much further than my young eyes could take in or appreciate. Welcome to NVC Life. I'm Rochelle Lamb, veteran NVC trainer and relationship coach, helping listeners navigate interpersonal conflict and ground more deeply into relational living. Greetings, fellow humans. This episode is about aging. I'm a grandmother now to two darling grandchildren who are seven and five years old, respectively. My grandson and I spoke over a video call just a few days ago on his seventh birthday, and I wonder, who am I to him? How does he see me, his grandmother? I remember my own grandmother on my father's side when I turned seven. She was 64 years old, only two years younger than I am now. My maternal grandmother had died at age 56 of a heart attack that same year when I was seven. So one living and one deceased. And I can tell you that what I remember is that both of these women were old. By old, I mean they looked their age. Both had gray hair, wrinkles, were thick around the waist and ankles. And when I think of how I viewed them at that young age, I would say that I saw them as entirely different creatures, perhaps even mystical creatures. Yes, there was a familiarity, but as well a foreignness. As they wrapped their soft grandmother arms around me, drawing me into their warm bosoms and saying things to me that indicated their deep recognition of me, even a simple exclamation, look at you. You've grown so much since I last saw you. Their words were honey-dipped and bound by the thick twine of kinship, extending so much further than my young eyes could take in or appreciate. I would be them one day. And that day has in many ways arrived. I will be 66 years old in a few days, having outlived one grandmother and, if it comes to pass, needing to make it to 90 to catch up with the other. But either way, I'm well in the terrain of aging, and that thick twine of kinship extends now to my two beautiful grandchildren, who hopefully see me as old and mysterious, just as I saw my grandmothers. Now, as I say this, I invite listeners to think about our society's aversion to old age. The platitudes abound. You're only as old as you feel. Age is inevitable. Aging isn't. The best wrinkle is the one you never get. Then there's, of course, the plastic surgery industry. A day without Botox is, just kidding, we have no clue. I'm a much nicer person when I can't frown. Life is short by the lips. I don't need to tell you. Look around and you'll see that there aren't many little old lady grandmothers around, with the exception of those confined to senior homes. We are addicted to our anti-aging products and procedures. According to market research, the global anti-aging market was valued at 63.01 billion U.S. in the year 2022 and is projected to reach a value of 106.65 U.S. billion by the year 2030. That's big dollars and big profit. If I consider the desire to euthanize from a needs perspective, I think I'd say that consumers make their choices to erase signs of aging in order to feel good about themselves and raise their self-esteem. Yes? and perhaps, too, to protect themselves from considering their eventual mortality. No matter the reason, our personal needs aren't the only needs on the table. What about the collective needs that aren't met by anti-aging strategies? Could these anti-aging interventions somehow be disruptive to the natural order of life itself? Could we be saying to kids, you don't have to age, and you should be fearful? 
or suspicious of those who do, in fact, age in your midst since they clearly don't recognize the advantages of staying young forever. Or how about this? Hey, if you don't like your body, no problem. The technology is here to give you a better you, the authentic you. I would be remiss if I didn't mention one of the very understandable and well-justified fears that any astute person would have around aging in these modern times. If I don't appear youthful, will I not become invisible, irrelevant, obsolete? It's a good question as well as a tragic one. Anyone who is even a bit knowledgeable about Indigenous cultures or about more traditional cultures would be familiar with their teachings regarding daily remembrance of ancestors and active honoring of one's elders. It would be both incomprehensible and damning in some parts of the world for an elderly person to be without family and community support in their aging and dying. Elders play a vital and essential role in traditional societies. They provide wisdom and guidance, and it is said that without them, the youth are lost. And while there are Westerners who do in fact extend care to their elders, by and large, our Western consumer culture could not be described as an elder-honoring culture. Many aging people quite sadly do feel invisible, irrelevant, and obsolete. And for many of them, at least in these markedly strange times, their concerns and observations around how life is unfolding for today's young people would seem antiquated, absurd, and likely condemning. Better to sit in the corner with a blanket wrapped around one's shoulders and look cute rather than say something meaningful and possibly unwelcome. Or perhaps even better to ditch aging altogether and plan your next action-packed cruise holiday. Just to be clear, I don't hold judgment against any senior citizen who is living it up during their senior years and or going under the knife or injection needle to trim years from their face and body. I simply mourn the fact that we don't live in a culture that honors and esteems aging or that considers the consequences that an obsession with staying young forever exerts on the world. Staying young, good. Getting old, bad. Here's an excerpt from Long Life, Honey in the Heart, a book written by author, artist, and storyteller Martine Prechtel recounting the involvement of elders in the lives of young people when their teenage hormones would kick in. The youth always underestimated the slow, zany vision of the very oldest villagers, those bent over ancient ladies who are more wrinkles than skin, more canyons than cliffs, not to mention these old-time cane-walking men shrunk down from years of overwork carrying loads twice their weight who talked too slow for the youth. Crouched around village corners, these old people, like old turtles on a log, had glazed monkey eyes that saw only in visions. Youth the world over chased the thought out of their minds that their juicy, well-inflated, unscarred bodies rolling around the village in the euphoria of limited experience will be led by everything they do to avoid growing up, to wander directly into the open jaws of age and life until they too, with any luck, will be gnawed into one of these beautiful gnarled old creatures. That's the end of the excerpt. Modernity makes no place for the beautiful gnarled old creatures that Prechtel speaks of. And I would theorize that the youth and therefore the world pay dearly for this prejudice in countless ways. I've spent considerable time reflecting on aging over the past decade, and during that time, I've only gotten older. I have three poems that I wrote on this subject that I'd like to share with you. The first is titled, Your Magnificent Story. Why would you wish to change the canvas of your beautiful face as you age? Why would you want to rid yourself of the unique terrain you have so deservedly come to inhabit? the visible and faithful testament that you have lived? Why would you not want people to recognize the multitude of seasons that considered you a worthy dance partner? The droughts and harvests, the winds and storms that have shaped your brow, supplied you with an enviable furrow, 
that have deepened and softened the gaze of your sorrowing and courageous eyes with tears that shine in the dark? Why would you not want to be that old gnarly tree that children can swing from as you creak? Why would you want to betray your own magnificent story, all the things you've done, all the ways you've fallen and gotten back up, all the ways you've said yes or no to love? Why would you want to let someone cut you away and inject you with the not you and then pay for it? Why would you want to not become fully yourself and be recognizable to your ancestors who walked before you when you die? Why? The second poem is a bit of a rant. I was feeling pretty feisty when I wrote it. It's called Don't Airbrush Me. This is what I look like. Don't airbrush me. I'm showing signs of aging. My neck ain't what it used to be. My cheeks have lost their fullness. I've got crow's feet around my eyes and those tiny lines around my lips. I've lost about an inch in height. My clothes are definitely tighter. I've got love handles and a handful of pizza dough where my belly once was flat. Shall I go on? Spider veins, varicose veins, my arms and thighs have lost their firmness. My ass is getting dimpled. I'm losing collagen every day. Don't airbrush me. My hands are getting freckled. My hair is graying. It's supposed to. My breasts are small. They always were. I have a rogue hair on my right nipple. There's no damn way I'm going under the knife. No implants for me. No nips or tucks. No needles. No Botox. I will say it again. Don't airbrush me. I will tell you what, though. I'm fiercer than I've ever been about attending to beauty and to all that really matters. I'm not trying to impress you anymore. I'm not invested in your approval. And I'll be darned. But when you give that up, Another beauty bursts forth, one that can't be held back or pruned or shut down so that no one feels uncomfortable. Maybe you don't find me that sexy or glamorous, but I'll see to it that you feel more beautiful in my presence, and that is beautiful. I'll appreciate your realness and insist that you be raw and true, that you become a human being and declare your loyalty to how the world needs you, no matter what it costs you. I'll tell you what, this aging thing, it will school you better than anything. When you climb out of bed, not feeling so spry, when you see your face each morning in the mirror, when the mojo for success won't be ignited by the will that you depended on for years, aging will put you back against the wall and say, you better get moving and start saying the things you didn't say so you could be liked or get married or get a raise at the office. I may not look like Penelope Cruz, but I'm every bit as hot. I've got my Joan of Arc sword. I'm taking a stand for mercy and for beauty and all the things this amazing world needs. I'm the old flamenco woman who gets up and struts her duende. She's been around, that woman has, aliveness in her sparkling eyes, grief and joy etched deep in the lines of her face. She knows a thing or two, so don't fucking airbrush me. Yeah, okay, so I was definitely feeling feisty when I wrote that one. This last poem is a more recent poem, and I will conclude the episode with it and by saying, I hope that some of what you've heard has you reconsidering the plight of aging in our time and its threat of extinction, and that perhaps you might even feel drawn to rehabilitate oldness and bring it back into the collective awareness by refusing yourself to go along with the anti-aging trends. This is called Let Me Be Old. Yesterday, I bought a sleeper, size zero to three months. Can I help you? Yes, I'm looking for a gift for a newborn. I'm presently on call to attend a birth. Are you a midwife? No, I'm not a midwife. The expectant mother wants an older woman to be close at hand. I'm the old woman. No, you're not. You're not old. I know she meant to compliment me, but she didn't. I'm old. I see myself in the mirror. I see my neck. I see the loss of elasticity. I see my thick ankles. I feel the arthritis and how my joints stiffen when I rise up from the chair. Let me be old. Let me serve you in my oldness. I see days behind me the smooth rose petals of my youth, quiet on the dark earth, and I see the days before me, and they are not the same. I am old. I think often of my dying. 
Everything is as it should be. Let me be old. Don't try to persuade me otherwise, because if you do, you will come to this time unable to be seen, unable to age, unable to raise your arms up to the night sky, to lay down offerings to the ebbing of your precious life, and all that such a final consecration bestows to you and signals to others. Let me be old for you, for me, for all that life grants us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning into NBC Life. For future episodes, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. For free resources or to book a private session with me, head over to rochellelam.com. Until the next time, stay sane, grateful, and generous. Thank you.